uh, expressions of love and support from their parents. It's a protective thing for young people in drinking. Okay, second principle is creating and encouraging alternative reward activities. Alternative activities to drinking. Alternative activities to the party that's going on this weekend where there might be drinking or drug use. Fun activities. What about the friends? This is a real, real rich social time. What about family dinners? What kind of focus in the schools or in a clinical setting or any kind of community-based community -based services that you have here in the county? How are some of these activities um, panning out in terms of offering up alternatives to drinking for young people? What kind of things do you all have going on? Skateboard parks. Skateboard parks. Very cool. Very much in line with this. Other things you got going on for youth. Yeah. Boys and Girls Club. Wonderful. We did take a lot of our kids, uh, like a lot of people live on Fox Games. Yes. Taking them to a game, taking them to a sporting event. Wonderful idea. Other things you got going on here. Yeah, all kinds of things within schools. What about with the high schools? Alternative to prom. After prom, big, big party night. What, what, what in the schools, are there going to be any alternatives for, for kids, like school-sponsored events as an alternative yeah. to like the drinking party? Yes, OK. And that's probably in process and getting worked on. I'm really happy to hear that. Because folks, if young people have alternative fun things that they're engaged in and that you all are helping with. You all are transporting them there. For parents, you're offering up maybe a few bucks. And it is going to hugely help young people. Now, let's take a look at family dinners. Because that is one thing that has been a huge surprise for me looking at this. Monthly drinkers reported 29%. Why might be that be? What, what's going on with frequent family dinners that that might serve as a Talking. Okay, so there's conversation at the dinner table, right? What other what else is going on that makes that a protective factor? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that love and support is can really nicely be expressed at the dinner table, talking and kind of finding out about the day, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're there at home. They're not somewhere else. Oh, and that's a big piece of it, too. They're not somewhere else. They're right at the, t at the dinner table, right? And there's something very powerful about sharing a meal together. This has been uh, repeated time and time and time and time again, uh, frequent family dinners. And yet, as young people get older and get involved in a lot of activities and are getting run around everywhere, and, and young people's schedules can be really busy, Sometimes the family dinners get fall by the wayside, you know? And so if, if parents, if families can hang on, if, if you can help families, encourage family, coach families to hang on to one or two dinners a week that they might want to kind of uh, drop to the wayside otherwise, that, that is a huge protective factor for young people. Now, here's the bottom line, and, and it was already pointed out, that folks, we're in competition for teenagers reward circuitry here. And it is not a level playing field. But we absolutely have to get strategic in our relationship, what we say, what we do with young people, and helping them to find fun, rewarding recreational activities that will serve as an alternative to drug involvement or alcohol involvement. It is a, it's a very biological thing in a sense their reward circuitry. And it is up for grabs right now at this period of development. OK, we've got three more principles. The third one is monitoring. Monitoring what? Well, here are some of the keys. Where are they? What are they doing? What kind of activities? Who are their peers with? This is really for parenting. But monitoring in the school setting is also real important. They're wandering the halls with a pass, without a pass. 
for parents, being up at curfew, being up when young people walk in the door, what's their status? The sniff test. What are they smelling like? What are they looking like? What's their mood? I see some of you smiling. There are parents of teenagers right here, and you get to check them out right in the door. Now, what about parties, and what about the overnights? Now, the overnights, it's popular. Teenagers doing them. They want them. They're requesting them. The overnights, if it's not in your home, you just gave up a little bit of your influence because now you actually are, are not as able to monitor them as well. Yeah. What do you do about the parents who have nothing more to do with their job? Because you're going to do it regardless, and I'd rather have you do it at my house. Okay. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that in a moment, which is what are we saying to kids? What kind of guidance are we providing them on their actual choices with alcohol? That's a critical, that's, that's a, that's a critical variable. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Because maybe some of these parties have alcohol that's actually condoned by the parents. Maybe the parents know it's there, right? Let's take a couple look, look at a couple of these things. My parents usually know where I am. Percentage that strongly agreed to that, we got barely one out of three monthly drinkers strongly agreeing that their parents usually know where they are. Folks, this is over double, over double kids who are abstaining saying that their parents usually know where they are. Parent monitoring is a huge deterrent to alcohol involvement. And when they walk in the door, being right there, checking them out, big deterrent. Now, what about the party scene? What about the party scene? There are some items on the survey that asked, how many of the parties you attend have alcohol available? And what you're going to see are the response of kids who reported no. No alcohol, none. And abstainers, about one out of two parties that they're going to do not have any alcohol. It does not have any alcohol present, which I find pretty, I mean, that's pretty fascinating. These kids are actually resisting temptation probably fairly regularly, one out of two parties. Monthly drinkers, is this going to go up? No alcohol? Down or be about the same? It's going to go up. So how many of the parties you attend have alcohol available? No parties have alcohol available? It's going to go down. It's going to go down. So alcohol is going to be available at the party. But how many parties are the monthly drinkers going to that have no alcohol at all? Not many. Not many. Which leads me to believe that part of the monthly drinking is seeking out and finding parties that alcohol is available. Now, how often have you been at somewhere, someone's house where teens were drinking alcohol and parents knew that they were drinking, actually had knowledge of alcohol being drank? Parties where this never happened at all, abstainers, 70%. And again, it's pretty surprising that there's 30% of kids who are not drinking in the past year who are going to parties where parents aren't knowing alcohol is being served. But what about the monthly drinkers? 14%. Folks, monthly drinkers are going to parties where parents are knowing at least some of the time that alcohol is being served. So, is there a correlation between parent approval of alcohol or maybe even knowing that alcohol is being drank in a home, in their own home, and teen consumption of alcohol? Yes, and you don't need scientists to tell you that. And we're going to get to a, a principle on this in a moment, but in terms of monitoring, it's also coaching parents and coaching family members to monitor alcohol right underneath your nose, right in the home. And let's extend that monitoring to the, the, the medicine cabinet, that prescription drugs are increasingly uh, gotten their hands on by young people. Uh, Kate, in her introduction, remarked that that is one of the fastest growing types of substances that are being used and abused by young people. Prescription drugs, 
such as painkillers, prescription drugs such as stimulants, which are actually a, a treatment for attention problems among young people. These are abusable substances. Kids can get hooked on this, and tragedy can strike. And, and I was very saddened to read about the tragedy that struck for the 13-year-old boy in the community on overdosing on the substance. So coaching parents to check the medicine cabinet, lock up the prescriptions, get the old ones out of there, and keep an eye on the alcohol as well. Now, let's get to the message on alcohol. What is your all stance on young people 